When are gun parts a firearm? The answer to that question may determine whether you go to federal prison or not for a violation of the National Firearms Act, Gun Control Act, or other important firearm laws. In this video, I will teach you the real law from real cases, statutes, and a key ATF ruling about when that pile of parts is legally considered a firearm, and as a result, when those gun kits or pistol braces may actually be a felony volcano waiting to erupt. There are critical do's and don'ts that I will give you in plain English at the end of the video about how you need to organize your parts to stay out of prison. Get ready to debunk gun store lore and internet legend with real law cases and that ATF ruling, as well as my three critical takeaways. My name's Tom Grieve. I'm a former state prosecutor, criminal defense attorney, and I'm trying to keep you safe and legal. Let's go. But guys, before we jump into this to debunk what some guy said on a forum or what your cousin or uncle Rusty Shackelford once told you is the case, very quick favor to ask. In order to help our channel grow, if you like this content and if you want to help us deliver more, please consider clicking like, subscribe, share this video around, and be sure to comment. Candidly, it helps us with the YouTube algorithm so that we show up more for others to see. Thank you very much, and now on with the show. So you own some parts that could be assembled to something that the ATF probably won't like. You have read some things about constructive intent and some other things saying that there's no such thing as constructive intent, and you frankly just want a straight-talking attorney, preferably in a blue blazer and black shirt, to tell you what's up. Welcome home. First, importantly and quickly, constructive possession is real. We will get to the intent part, but let's build there very quickly. What is constructive possession? Constructive possession is a legal doctrine that talks about the fact that sometimes you can be in legal possession of an item even if you are not in actual possession of the item. Definitions may vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but generally two things are always present. Knowledge of the object and access or the ability to control it. So why do we even have constructive possession laws? The answer is basically drugs and people really not owning up to the fact that they knew it was there. You see, whenever police stop a car or they find somebody in possession of marijuana, cocaine, whatever the case may be that's illegal in their particular jurisdiction at their particular time, one thing tends to keep occurring. Namely, people don't really own up to them as theirs. In other words, they say, look, yeah, I know you just pulled out of my sock, my underpants, my whatever. Yeah, that's not my sock. That's not my underwear. I borrowed that from a cousin, a friend, something like that. I don't know how it got into there. So as a result, we have to deal with the fact in the criminal justice system that there's a lot of illegal things, but when the cops show up, no one ever seems to own them or know about them. So there has to be a way of showing the mens rea. I'm going to get to that in a second, but there has to be a way of showing how do they know about that? How do they have knowledge of it? Not tying to ownership. I want to give you a real life example. Imagine you go to a restaurant and you sit down and you've never been at that restaurant before you're out traveling. There's a salt and a pepper shaker sitting at the table. Now, you've never seen that salt and pepper shaker before. You may have never touched it before, but the fact that you're sitting at the table, it's within your reach, you can see it, you've got the knowledge and the ability to control it or possess it, means that you are now in constructive possession of that salt shaker. But importantly, let's say the cops show up and now they open up that salt shaker, the one at your very table, and it's actually loaded with cocaine or something else. You legitimately had no idea. Security footage put you walking in moments before the cops showed up. Well, you are no longer going to be in constructive possession of the cocaine because you actually had no knowledge of it. Unless they go through your cell phone, they find something else. Or maybe if you're in California and this is something that just as common and happens. I, I, I don't really know. I generally stay out of California. No offense to those of you out there. In order to have constructive possession, we again need the two things, the knowledge as well as we need the ability to control it, influence it. So in our salt shaker example, we can see what's on the outside, but maybe we don't know what's on the inside. So that really goes to highlight the fact that mens rea, which literally in Latin translates as guilty mind, is going to be a critical part of the justice system. And you're going to see how this all builds. Stay with me. So for the mens rea, there's basically four levels. I'm not going to go into the whole thing. It's intent, knowledge, reckless, and negligent. Those are the four different levels of criminal mens rea. If you want me to go into that more in a separate video, let me know in the comment field below. But the bottom line is that what we don't have, generally speaking, is what we call strict liability. Strict liability is the premise for the fact that, look, you can't just, for instance, speed 
And now the fact that we're going over the speed limit equals automatic speeding ticket. Doesn't matter if we knew what the speed limit was or something like that. That's generally the law in many different states. What we don't have that for, barring a specific act of Congress, is we do not have that in felony cases. We do not have that in felony charges. Unless Congress specifically strips out the mens rea, there's always gonna be a level of mens rea there. But because we always have that need for intent, for knowledge, or something like that, combined with the fact that generally in the criminal justice system, people have a tendency of not owning up to things, that's where we get to constructive intent. Keep in mind, of course, when we're talking about criminal cases, it's impossible to look into someone's mind. So we need a way to infer their intent if the level of knowledge is intent that we're going for. And we often have to do that from their actions. So a couple examples, one really big one is of course, if you look at the recent Waukesha Parade Massacre, keep in mind, I am from Waukesha, Wisconsin. The recent Waukesha Parade Massacre where one lunatic basically drove a truck through a crowd of folks, killing many, injuring scores more. The way that the prosecutors are able to obtain a conviction in that case was they were able to show that, look, if you take a truck through a crowd of people, you don't stop, you keep going, that's intent. We can infer intent there. Likewise, if you're just driving the wrong way in traffic at high speeds, cars are swerving all around you, something like that, and eventually you hit someone, there's gonna be a level of knowledge and intent that goes into that. Your actions were reasonably and foreseeable in order to create that kind of outcome. Therefore, at a certain point, we get knowledge, we get intent, we get whatever is relevant to that particular issue at hand for how someone's charged. How is this tying to guns? Here we go on this. So one case I want to kick this off with is Staples versus United States. This was a case where a gentleman allegedly modified an AR-15 so they could actually fire in full auto. The fact that it fired in full auto seemed to be reasonably beyond dispute. What was the dispute in this case was whether or not he knew it could fire in full auto because at trial he testified that he actually had no idea. The case wound up going up to the US Supreme Court and at the end of the day, the court said, look, you cannot have strict liability offenses in these sorts of cases. In other words, large cases like felonies. Again, we talked about the strict liability. You're gonna see how this all connects to constructive intent. So without strict liability, the government needs to be able to show that you had some level of mens rea appropriate to whatever the particular crime we're talking about here, oftentimes knowledge, oftentimes intent, sometimes reckless or negligence. And because the government, in this case, I suppose, couldn't show it as a result, no conviction. But really the biggest thing that we get here from this particular case for our purposes here today no strict liability. There needs to be some sort of mens rea. And guys, if you want me to go more into this case, let me know in the comment section below. Okay, so we've got mens rea in criminal cases. So we know we need some sort of level of knowledge or intent. Now enters another big case. And we've got three big cases all together. We got through one, now we're on the second one. And that's United States versus Thompson Center. In this case, we're talking about short barrel rifles, sometimes known as SBRs. So keep in mind, guys, it is illegal and a felony barring a particular federal paperwork, Form 1, Form 4, all that kind of good stuff, subject for a different video. Let me know if you want me to get into that in the comment field below. But generally speaking, in order to make sure that we do not have an SBR, so we have a normal rifle that's lawful to possess, the rifle needs to have at least a 26 inch or greater overall length. We usually measure that from the telescoping sock, the folding sock at maximum extended position. And we need a barrel length of at least 16 inches or greater. If we do not have either one, so we need both of those, 26 inches or greater of overall length, 16 inches and up a barrel length, then we may have what's called a short-barreled rifle. And it's gonna be a short-barreled rifle versus a pistol, depending upon whether or not it was designed in order to be fired one-handed or to be designed from firing from the shoulder. So imagine a stock going into your shoulder to fire a rifle. That makes it a rifle versus being designed to fire not from a shoulder, that's gonna be a pistol. That's the law that you need to know there. Back to Thompson Setter. 1985 Thompson Center, that's the company that makes a lot of those single shot pistols as well as those single shot rifles that you may see on Gunbroker and other websites. Well, they came out with a kit for their contender pistol. And in the kit, there were primarily four parts we're concerned about. A 10 inch barrel, a 21 inch barrel, a pistol stock, and a rifle stock. So we've got four parts. This can be assembled into three different firearms. A pistol, a rifle, and a short barrel rifle. We get to the SBR if we combine the 10 inch barrel with the rifle stock, because now we have a rifle that's designed to be fired from the shoulder, but does not have a 16 inch or greater barrel, let alone whatever the overall length is. But because we know it's not at least a 16 inch barrel, no good, SBR. So we've got the SBR law now coming in under the National Firearms Act. 
And the ATF looked at this kit and they said, look, you've got a combination of parts that can be assembled into an SBR configuration. Therefore, the mere possession of this combination of parts, even if it is not assembled into an SBR, equals an SBR. Therefore, mere possession without that proper Form 1, Form 4, whatever the case may be for you, depending upon your particular licensing scenario, if you're the first owner, successor owner, whatever the case may be, then look, you're looking at a felony here. So the question here really for the court is, when is a firearm made? Is a firearm made when we just have the mere possession of all the parts that when put together, we have a firearm, but they're not put together? That's, of course, what the ATF is saying. At the other end of the equation, we have what Thompson Center is claiming, which is a firearm is when you basically have a final, full assembled firearm. That's when we have a firearm. Or is it someplace in between? Well, the NFA has a little bit of guidance on this, so we're going to turn to the statute really quickly. What it says is the term make and the various derivatives of such word shall include manufacturing other than by one qualified to engage in such business under this chapter, putting together, altering any combination of these or otherwise producing a firearm. That's according to 26 USC section 5845 sub I. By the way, quick little fun tidbit about this case, in order for Thompson Center to get standing to sue the ATF, because that's a big deal in cases, is how do you get standing? So what they had to do is they actually filed a Form 1, paid the $200, but only for the kit. They never assembled it into that SBR configuration. Once they were approved for their Form 1, they then went ahead and demanded a refund under something called the Tucker Act, saying that they never assembled it to actually possess an SBR. And as a result, it was their contention that, of course, the unassembled parts are not an SBR. We want a refund. After six months went by, ATF never really responded, never really did anything, and now we've got standing to sue. Brilliant. But we move on with what we're concerned about here. In the case, the ATF created an analogy to make their point. They said, look, court, and we're talking about the U.S. Supreme Court. Look, court, if we've got a box of bicycle parts, everything we need to make a bicycle, but it's not assembled, that's still a bicycle because that can be assembled into a bicycle. The court strongly disagreed here, and they pointed out the fact that a box containing an unassembled bicycle that can only be made into a bicycle, that may be a bicycle, but that's not what we have here. Because of course, we have a box in the Thompson Center kit that can actually be three things, two of them legal. So really, again, the question still remains, when do the parts become a gun? So guys, I'm going to put the actual wording from the case on the screen for those law nerds, but for those of you who want the English version, here we go. Basically, the court ruled that Congress does not agree with Thompson Center's definition, namely that a firearm is only made when it's fully assembled. So they put a bookend saying, Thompson Center, you're wrong. It's actually a firearm at some point prior to final assembly. So they said that the definition for a firearm is more expansive than what Thompson Center wanted. But by invoking the rule of lenity, the court also said that, look, because they're so vague, it's really not up to the court to draw the lines. That's Congress's job to decide exactly when a firearm is made. Because we're unclear of this, basically, when kind of goes to the defendant because there's different ways of interpreting this. Also from the case, from page 510 of the decision, we get to the heart of the issue. We think the language of the statute provides a clear answer on this point. The definition of make includes not only putting together, but also manufacturing or otherwise producing a firearm. If, as Thompson Center submits, a firearm were only made at the time of the final assembly, namely the moment that the firearm was put together, the additional language would be redundant. Congress must then have understood making to cover more than final assembly, and some disassembled aggregation of parts must be included. Since the narrowest example of a combination of parts that might be included is a set of parts that could be used to make nothing but a short barrel rifle, the aggregation of such a set of parts, at the very least, must fall within the definition of making such a rifle, end quote. So guys, this is the hardy issue, and it's super important that we get this. What the court decided is that because it could be assembled into a legal firearm as well as an illegal firearm, and because Congress was vague on the definition of what make is, they said that it is not an SBR because it can be assembled into a legal firearm. But guys, don't click off because we have another really big case as well as, super importantly, the ATF rule coming in as well as my quick takeaways. What the court did was basically give a nod in Thompson Center to the fact that kits and parts can be firearms, even when not assembled fully, 
but declined to state a bright line rule or test or magic percent completion mark equals a firearm. Not the first court to reach this decision that parts can be treated as guns. Really quickly, in a case called USV Drazen, they were basically a company selling unassembled firearm kits. And these kits were largely assembled. There were a couple pieces that according to the case just kind of had to be slipped together at the end of the day. Notably, however, the barrels were not 16 inches and Drazen was contending the fact that there was a flash suppressor that could be attached to the end of it, which brought the barrels greater than 16 inches. That means that really in its final state of assembly, this should be good to go is what they said. The ATF disagreed and said, look, you're building an SBR. There's nothing saying they have to put the flash suppressor on the end of it. Moreover, the part kits are largely already assembled and everything needed to build that SBR is right there in the box. Drazen, which was not a U.S. Supreme Court decision, but cited in the Thompson Center case, basically wound up going down and standing for the premise that yes, part kits, particularly ones that are largely assembled and collected together in one spot, we can basically build those through that constructive intent principle to say, all right, where is this going? And let's kind of play that out. That's Drazen for you. So bottom line here is yes, again, parts can be guns from two federal cases, including a U.S. Supreme Court decision. So I know what you're saying. Those cases are great, Tom. I appreciate the lesson, but how will the ATF actually arrest and charge people for this? Fortunately, they gave us some guidance of that in a 2011 ruling letter. But I'm about to get there really quickly, guys. 90% of you who watch our videos are not subscribers. Please just take a moment. It really helps us make videos. Click subscribe, like, share it around. Thank you very much, moving on. So the ATF actually staked out some reasonably aggressive ground on this, and it comes from a ruling named 2011-4. It's linked below in the description box if you want to see it. But here's kind of the relevant part. I'm going to read it directly here, also put it on the screen. However, the court, U.S. v. Thompson Center, also explained that an NFA firearm is made if aggregated parts are in close proximity, such that they A, serve no useful purpose other than to make an NFA firearm, or B, convert a complete weapon into an NFA firearm. So that's in essence the ATF's take. If we have a collection of parts, they're in close proximity and it can only be built into one thing and that one thing is illegal, it's an NFA item like an SBR or something like that, then basically we can use constructive intent to put that thing together and see where it goes. And if it ends in an illegal spot, then according to the ATF relying on Thompson Center, we're in back to that felony land right there. So. That's gonna be the big thing. What are the bottom line takeaways that you need to know though, now that you've heard the statutes, three different cases, as well as the ATF code. And before I get to my three big takeaways about this, I want you to tell me in the comment field below, what other gun myths, legends, and lore do you want me to see bust? What do you want to see me tackle and get into? Let me know in the comment section below, as well as what do you think about this video? What do you think about the ATF and these Supreme Court decisions as well? Guys, here's my three big takeaways. And I want to really kind of preface this all with the fact that this is not legal advice. I really want to be emphatically clear about this. We're having a conversation about firearm law. I'm doing my best to make sense of what kind of cases are out there. How does this all fit together? But of course, law changes with place and time. I don't know where you are or when you're watching this. So please, before you do anything and before you make the decisions about what you need to do to keep yourself on the right side of the law, please make sure to, of course, check your local listings about what the laws are. Here's my three takeaways. Number one, best case scenario. The safe line here is that, for instance, you have a shorty AR-15 upper, you've got pistol braces, you've got something like that, is keep them assembled in a legal configuration. Because at that point, you no longer have to worry about any kind of constructive intent argument about what this could be assembled into. It's already assembled. It's already in a final form. So if you're going to be keeping these items that could be combined into something that could be illegal or something like that, the simplest thing is just eliminate the argument altogether. Don't play the game. Assemble it into something lawful and we can kind of sidestep the mess. Number two, the minimum compliance approach. The minimum compliance line appears to be that as long as you have a legal way to assemble the firearm, then you appear to be okay. So that means that if you have a bunch of pieces of firearms put together, such as kits or something like that in one particular spot, whether that's a bag, a closet or something like that, ensure that you include components that would allow you to assemble it into a lawful configuration. This is not my preferred route, but basically this would be the minimum compliance position. Number three, this is the firewall. This is the don't do this or go to prison route, potentially at least. 
and that's keep the items together alone in close proximity that can only be assembled into an SBR or something else that could be illegal. Again, this is obviously going to be used to show the constructive intent, which is the entire subject of this video, as well as multiple cases that we just went through, as well as the ATF ruling. Guys, if you enjoyed this video, once more, I really appreciate you watching to the end. The algorithm loves you too. We'll see you in the next one.